Welcome to a Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Dr. Louise Richardson, who is the Executive Dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. She is the author most recently of What Terrorists Want, Understanding the Enemy, Containing the Threat. Louise, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Where were you born and raised? Um, I was born in uh, the southeast coast of Ireland, in County Waterford, uh, which is a small seaside town. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Um, not self-consciously at all, actually. My parents were very apolitical, uh, but growing up in rural Ireland at a time where the past was always very much present, um, we grew up, I grew up in the same house. My mother had grown up and my grandmother had grown up and we were, I think, the fourth generation in this house. So we were deeply rooted in this community. So almost by osmosis, I picked up more from the community than my parents per se, their, their view on the world or their view on, in particular, on, on Irish history. Mm -hmm. And uh, how, how were you affected by uh, events, uh, being Irish in Ireland, growing up and, and so forth? I was very, very keenly affected by events. Well, we grew up in a world where, where Britain was the enemy. I learned history at school at, you know, at the age of nine, was writing anti-English poems, diatribes against England because we thought, or we knew that they were responsible for everything that had ever gone, on, gone wrong in Ireland. Um, and then, of course, seeing Northern Ireland explode in the late 1960s, early 1970s. This we saw as just a continuation of the age-old British oppression uh, of Ireland. We just took this very much for granted. Um, in school, every morning, we, I went to a, the local convent and we, um, we said our prayers together behind a, uh, underneath a statue of the crucifix and a photograph of the seven men who were executed for their role in the 1916 Rising. So religion and politics were intertwined. Um, actually, the lesson of the crucified Christ and these executed leaders mm -hmm. tended to be one and the same, which is that you know, the fact that you're vilified in your own day or that the authorities punish you doesn't necessarily mean that you're bad or wrong. And I, mm -hmm. I've been very struck by that's very different. Even though this was all unstated, it's very different from the way my children grew up in this country and their sense of progress and if people are punished by the state, one tends to assume that they've done something bad. Mm -hmm. did, did you decide at an early age that, that you wanted to study this history or, or what in fact did you do your undergraduate work on? Well, my undergraduate work was on history and political science um, and I studied in Trinity College Dublin, which was an entirely different uh, world and the world in which I grew up. Trinity historically was where uh, the Protestant aristocracy were educated. So mm. many of the faculty were, were English. It was a very much a, a British institution. Uh, Trinity actually accepted Catholics in the late 18th century, but the Catholic Church didn't uh, permit Catholics to attend Trinity till, till about 1970 or the 1960s, certainly. So it was a very different world. So I studied Irish history, but got an utterly different perspective mm -hmm. than the one I'd grown up with. And how did you adjust to that? What, 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 tell us about your feelings, your thought processes, how you related to your family as, as you, you saw these different perspectives. Well, I grew up, as I say, I, I would con have considered myself passionately Republican. I spoke the Irish language at, at one stage in preference to speaking English. I, I went to school for time in an area in which Irish was the medium of instruction, and certainly there was a very powerful Republican, as in the Irish rather than American sense, ethos there. So then going to uh, Trinity, being very self-conscious, one of only three Catholics in my class, um, I started to study history with, uh, with res uh, professors I very much respected. So my, initially I thought, my gut reaction was, of course, this is all nonsense. But once one got into it, once one started reading the documents, I was completely persuaded by their version. So I would go home and challenge many of what were the absolutely mm -hmm. accepted truths. And I remember my mother at one time uh, just dismissing this as Trinity talk. Um, mm -hmm. This is nonsense. Um, so it was fascinating and I became fascinated by how two sets of people, well-meaning people, I have enormous respect and affection, 
both for my family background and then for my college professors and realized you know, these two sets of people utterly believed completely different versions of the very same event that happened in this tiny country. So I became very interested by how two sets of good, if you will, people can yet interpret the same events so differently. And, and did you pursue graduate studies as a result of, of this set of experiences, or, or, or was actually, it unrelated? Actually, no. I, I decided I wanted to study uh, international relations largely as uh, an effort to escape the power of Irish nationalism or the smallness of Irish nationalism. So I decided to, to come to America to study international relations as a way of, of breaking out of this. Um, but then when I came to the States, uh, I felt and started looking at the literature on, uh, on Ireland. I, I didn't work on Ireland for years. I, I never trusted my objectivity. I stayed very involved, but um, not academically. I simply, but I did read all the literature and I found that so uh, it, this depiction of, of terrorists as one-dimensional bad guys uh, and psychopaths was, was quite wrong, um, quite oversimplified, and certainly inconsistent with the many people I knew who had decided to join the IRA, for example. Um, so initially, my prism, obviously, was, was that uh, of the IRA and, and the Republican movement. But uh, it, I broadened out then to start studying other terrorist groups and again felt that the, the depiction of them in the literature was really uh, misplaced. As a, as a student of international relations first, and I, I believe your first book was on When Allies Differ, Anglo-American Relations in the Suez and Falkland Crisis. I'm, I'm curious as what you see as the, the skill set that is required to do international relations well. Well, um, as I said, my undergraduate degree was in history, so I come very much from the historical approach to, to international relations. And looking, that, that first book was actually looking at how allies manage uh, crises in which their interests diverge. So what I think I brought to that was a very historical approach, which is to go back to look at the documents of the period. I looked at the Suez Crisis and uh, under the 30-year rule in Britain, the archives were just opened when I was doing my research. I also looked at the Vulcans crisis, and for that I, I interviewed all the members of Mrs. Thatcher's war cabinet and many of the members of the Reagan, senior members of the Reagan administration. So the skills I brought to bear was the historian's uh, respect mm. for primary sources uh, and going back to the individuals and the original documents, which is again what I try to do in, in looking at terrorism. Mm -hmm. Now, now let's talk a little about the, the study of, of terrorism, because in, in your book, uh, uh, and I think rightfully so, you express disappointment uh, at uh, the way terrorism was being approached in the, uh, uh, the studies uh, uh, that you discovered or, or knew about and so on. Uh, how do you account for that intellectual failure? Well, I actually think it was partly because terrorism was, didn't belong in any one discipline. There isn't a, a coherent theoretical basis in the study of terrorism. Instead, you had psychologists look at terrorism, anthropologists, some political scientists, some historians. And so terrorism was never at the cutting edge in any discipline. It never addressed, uh, could have, but didn't address any of the central theoretical debates in any discipline. So it tended to be marginalized in each of these disciplines. So. Um, Individual, so there was this small cohort of what were known as the terrorism studies community, but we're talking about a, a couple of dozen people. Um, and they, I think, did have a, quite a sophisticated and in-depth understanding of the particular groups that they looked at. But very few people were interested in looking at terrorism qua terrorism, so terrorism across cultures or across time. They tended to focus on the one particular terrorist group. Uh, and even today, we still don't have a, a discipline uh, of terrorism, per se. Was this also true, by the way, in, in, in the British academic circles, or did they do a better job of it because of the experience uh, with empire and, and understanding cultures? Um, actually, I think there it was mainly left to the military schools who studied counterinsurgency uh, rather than uh, terrorism, per se. So, I, no, I don't think it was essentially different. Now, uh, all of this, of course, has changed now, not in the sense that the quality is better, uh, I'll let you judge that, of, of the terrorist studies, but when America confronted uh, uh, the events of 
and, and suddenly we realized uh, that uh, there was a bigger problem than we thought. Uh, so let, let's now walk through uh, some of the problems that we really confront. When we're talking about terrorism, what specifically are we talking about? Let's be sure our audience understands that. That's, I think, a crucial point and one that's not made nearly often enough. By terrorism, I simply mean uh, the deliberate targeting of non-combatants for a political purpose. And in my work on terrorism, I, I look exclusively at the behavior of sub-state groups rather than looking at state behavior. Um, so that's what I mean by the, by the study of terrorism. And, and are, what are the characteristics of this ph phenomena that, that we should know about before we get into discussion of who right. the terrorists are and what they want? Well, first and foremost, a, a terrorist act is a political act. If it's not, it, it's simply a crime, which doesn't make it good, or, uh, good it, but it's, it has to be politically inspired to be a terrorist act. Simply, uh, secondly, it must involve violence or the threat of violence. Another characteristic, I think, is that terrorism is symbolic. Uh, Terrorists are invariably both outmanned and outgunned by their opponents. The point is for the impact of their act to be greater than the actual physical act itself. So they tend to choose symbolic targets to enhance the impact. The fourth point, which is very important, I think, is that the point of terrorism is not violence for the sake of it. And it's not even violence in the expectation of defeating the enemy, but rather violence to communicate a political message. So it's a form of communication. Uh, another crucial characteristic, I think, is that the victim of terrorists and the audience they're trying to influence is not the same. And that's quite unusual for people who choose to use violence. So whether they kill you or me is fairly immaterial. We're just representative of, of, of some other. They're trying to influence usually our government. And finally, and, and most importantly, it's the deliberate targeting of non-combatants. Now, not as an unintended side effect, but as deliberate strategy. So terrorists are, are deliberately elevating practices which are seen as the excesses of warfare to deliberate strategy. So what all of this is to say is that it's, it's the means that they use and not the ends that they pursue that determines whether or not a group is a terrorist group. And I think over the years, your deceptively simple question, uh, people haven't been able to answer it because nobody's willing to label a group a terrorist group if they agree with what the terrorist is trying to achieve. If they think the terrorist objective is just, they won't label them a terrorist. And I say that's irrelevant. Uh, I think uh, people with perfectly legitimate goals have, have employed terrorist tactics. Uh, and it doesn't matter. It, it, that should be a, a different question. Uh, a classical illustration of this would be the Nicaraguan Contras. Uh, President Reagan, as you know, considered them the moral equivalent of our founding fathers. And he did so because he shared their objective of, of overthrowing the Sandinista government in Nicaragua. On the other hand, most of our European allies considered them far from being terrorists, but, but legitimate fighters. And that's because they agreed with their uh, um, or they disagreed, rather, with their objective of trying to overthrow the Sandinista government. My point is that it's the means that they use, not the ends that they pursue, that determines whether or not a group is a terrorist group. And unless we're willing to label a group whose goals we consider just, but who deliberately target non-combatants to achieve those goals, we're never going to be able to forge effective uh, international cooperation against terrorism. So what we have is, a, is an argument about the framing of the issue, it sounds like. And this helps us, I think, understand why uh, groups that in the past have used terrorism may now denounce it once they've achieved their goal and so on. So the, there really is a lot of confusion about who the, terror, who the terrorists are, what they want. But it's a confusion that furthers the interests of some parties or states that, that may have an interest in doing that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the only universally accepted attribute of the term terrorism is that it's pejorative. It's something the bad guys do. So people wish to pin the label terrorism on their opponents in the hope of, of legitimizing their own position. Um, and I think, again, it's imperative that we, we move, away, look, move away from that, look simply at what means do they employ. And if they deserve to be labeled terrorism, call them terrorists. And, and this is not, um, um, as Americans, uh, we like to think of everything happening here for the first time. But, but this is an old phenomena that goes way back in history. It's oh, not absolutely. new. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, goes back 
well, documented cases at least as far back as the first century after Christ. And even where many Americans would accept, well, this has happened before, we tend to think that the particular version that we've seen today, which is the groups with a fusion of religious and political motives, is, is new. But in fact, it's not. Prior to the French Revolution, every terrorist group had the same mixture of religious and political motives. It was just that with the secularization of society generally that you had, and after the French Revolution, terrorists reflected that. So it took until the 1960s, again, for the emergence of groups which tended to have this uh, fusion of, of religious and political motives. But terrorism has been around a very long time, and that's significant both intellectually but also on a policy level, because if we believe, as, as has been said way too often in Washington, this is a whole new world, the world is completely different, it suggests that there's nothing we can learn uh, from the experience of others. And that, again, I think is mistaken. I think there's a great deal we can learn if we accept that, in fact, uh, there is something to be learned from the experience of others. Uh, you say uh, early in your book that uh, 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 an important point for you was that, that you had to start by saying the terrorists are human beings. I mean, that they, you know, uh, uh, and uh, you, you cite the example, I guess, of a war game that you were doing before 9-11 uh, in which academics were uh, participating with insurgents and what, what happened in that game because it was kind of revealing. Yes, it was. This was a group we convened of uh, about half academics and half of what we politely termed activists, but members of, of terrorist groups. And we, we ran it in two ways. First, we had a, for all intents and purposes, like an academic conference. So I gave a paper on conditions that drive terrorist, uh, factors that drive terrorist uh, decisions to escalate to a new level of violence. And the number two men in a, in a, in a well-known terrorist group then gave the commentary on my paper. It, so very much like any other political conference, this of course was smaller and private. And and this was before 9-11? This was before 9-11, yes. Um, and then the second few days we decided we, we formed groups, uh, joint groups, um, and we had written some uh, scenarios and we were acting out these scenarios. So the particular group I was involved in, we imagined we were a Chechen cell in Moscow and we're coming under increasing pressure. So again, we're trying to get at what drives people to elevate, either to uh, broaden their targets or a new type of weapon and so on. Um, and there was no difference between the proclivity of the activists to escalate and the proclivity of the, ter uh, the, the academics. In fact, the terrorists were quite surprised at how quick mm -hmm. uh, academics were to um, escalate. And in my case, um, you know, I tended to be very rational and, and reluctant to escalate until I was sure we had the resources to do that, uh, which is um, essentially the same type of mental apparatus I bring to any other decision making. Um, so it, it seemed to me that there was, no, there, there was absolutely no inherent difference between the, the proclivity of terrorists and academics to escalate. The only exception to that actually came in the case of uh, we, we raised the issue of a, a, an imaginary German uh, uh, Russian general or colonel who was returning to Moscow and who had raped a, a young Chechen girl. And what should we do about this? And, and I argued, we're too small, we're too weak, there's nothing we can do, let's leave it. Uh, some members of um, a, a Middle East, well, a Middle East terrorist group said, absolutely not, even if it means we all die, our honor has been offended and we must kill this colonel, even if we all die in the process. So that was the only area, and the question of honor, if you will, where there, were, there seemed to be a difference between this small group of, of terrorists uh, and this group of academics. But in all other decisions, the academics were at least as likely, and in some instances, much more prone to elevate or to escalate faster than the terrorists themselves. Uh, this intellectual uh, leap that, that you were able to make, which is to say, well, these are humans, and, and let's sort of uh, look at what's going on here. Uh, is, is that rare, or was it rare in this field? I mean, obviously, we've talked about how you mm -hmm. came to that mm -hmm. position, uh, because it, it strikes me that at least after 9-11, it was very rare, and that the people who might have brought what, what you could bring because of your Irish background, namely people who knew the Muslim world and so on, weren't in a position to, to affect uh, thinking in the way mm -hmm. that you have. 
I think that's right. And I would also say, though, that they weren't invited in. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, at the risk of sounding partisan, I, I do think one of the characteristics of, of this administration has really been a, a Bush real, administration. Yes, yeah. the Bush administration has been a real reluctance to bring in others who who might have give a different perspective. Um, I think in the early days, I think the Bush administration was looking around, but when they for uh, advice, but if when the advice came that was different from their uh, their own proclivities to act, they, they, they disregarded it. So um, there were, I think there were many people who could have given the type of perspective I would give who, who were not brought in at all. Um, so I th certainly within the administration, it was seen as, uh, it was utterly rare, rare to hear this kind of perspective. And one can understand because of the extent or the scale of the atrocity, but I think it's crucial to realize that it was human beings who carried this out. Uh, as a political scientist, how do you explain that failure? Was it a uh, was it a failure of the way they conducted the politics of the administration, or was it a, 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 a failure that came from the in, in, instruments of power that they were inclined to use, namely a heavy focus on military power? Well, I think it was a failure of leadership first and foremost. Yeah. I would think any. Uh, leader worthy of his position, his or her position, should be open to hearing counterpoints of view, if only to defend themselves against them. But I think, I think you really have to go back as far as yeah, the administration of Woodrow Wilson to find uh, to find an administration so convinced in their own rectitude that they're completely unwilling to entertain counterpoints of view. So in that sense, just organizationally, I think it's down, it's good practice to hear counterpoints of view. Um, the second uh, inclination to use military force was, of course, very much the inclination of, of many of the leaders of, of, of the Bush administration. Again, that's understandable, but it's, you know, to use an Irish analogy, a little like the drunk looking for his, his car keys under the lamppost mm -hmm. because the light is better there, not, not because he lost them there. And we have this absolutely formidable army and we have a problem, so let's use the, the weapon we have against it without stopping to think about whether it's the most appropriate weapon. Again, I think if we had looked at the experience of other countries six years ago, we would have realized very quickly that uh, the military doesn't defeat terrorism, uh, hasn't defeated terrorism, or at least democracies have not successfully deployed the military to defeat terrorism. Some countries have, like yeah, the uh, Latin American dictators, but at a cost that's completely incompatible with democracies. And countries like Russia hasn't been able to translate military strength into victory against Chechnya. The Israelis haven't against the Palestinians. So um, it's very clear, or it was very clear six years ago, it's thankfully a little more apparent to people now, that you cannot simply use the military to solve what is a political problem. Before we talk about that political problem, let's, let's go further on the, the, the mistakes that the Bush administration made. You identify uh, four. Let's talk about them. They declared war on terrorism. What, what, what is wrong with that? Oh, there is so much that's wrong with that. That was a, <laughs> it's a leading question. <laughs> a terrible mistake. Uh, yes, how much time do we have? Where does one begin? Um, I can fully understand, given the scale of the atrocity, why any administration of any ideological view would have been determined to give the strongest possible mm. response. And a declaration of war is, of course, the strongest possible response. But uh, it is exactly what the terrorists wanted us to do. We are the most powerful country in the history of the planet. This was a bunch of extremists living under the sponsorship of one of the poorest governments on the planet. The asymmetry in our power was overwhelming. So we elevate their stature to a degree of which they could only dreamt by declaring war on them. And you're, you're essentially declaring war on a means. Yes, on a opposed, tactic, which yeah. makes no sense. Yeah. When terrorism is a tactic, terror is an emotion. So it makes no more sense to declare war on the tactic of terrorism, much less the emotion of terror, than on any other tactic or any other emotion. I mean, you can't win a war against a tactic. A tactic will be used as long as it's effective. Some, someone uh, that I read recently said that it was like declaring war on air power. Right, or precision-guided <laughs> bombing, yes. It's, yeah. it's preposterous. One, one cannot win that kind of war. But, but also the impact domestically, and again, you know, the attractiveness of a declaration of war to any 
executive is clear because of the accretion of power that invariably uh, adheres to the executive who does declare war. But um, it, it connotes notions of victory and defeat. And as we've discovered in the past six years, what does that mean when, when we come to, to fighting terrorism? And will capturing bin Laden mean victory? I, I think not. Uh, does victory mean making our country impregnable to another attack? Well, we can't do it. It's impossible. Um, does this mean that they can dispatch any random operative into any McDonald's in this country or Starbucks and blow it up and prove that we haven't won? I mean, that's conceding far, much to, uh, far too much to mm. them. Um, it also has, as I say, so in, in my view, the, the goal of, of defensive warfare should be to deny your adversary whatever it is they're trying to achieve. And I, I think by declaring war on them, we're, we're actually conceding what it is they're trying to achieve. Plus, there's the, the uh, obvious fact that it suggests deployment of the military. And, and, and as I said, I, I don't think the military is the, the right instrument in this instance. I mean, the military can certainly have a role to play. Uh, a military can, can fight the um, terrorists to a standstill or to a stalemate in, in some instances to make room for politics. Um, but the military can also as we've seen in this case, dramatically uh, increase the, the support for, uh, for terrorist groups by making it appear that we are at war with those they claim to represent. The, the second error, and, and in, in a few minutes we'll talk about your analysis of what terrorism, but I think it, it's useful at this point to go over some of these things. Uh, they, they say they conflated Osama and Saddam. That, that's, that's right. Uh, my shorthand for that, but but we're really talking about here. They they confuse state power and state-sponsored terrorism with with essentially the subgroups who had instigated this attack. So it was right. a total misunderstanding of the history and of the adversary. Absolutely. I mean, if you go back over time, we've tended to see state-sponsored terrorism as as you know the simple behavior of, of states, and yet. The, the relationships between particular states and the terrorists they have sponsored it runs the whole gamut from, on the one hand, uh, you know, groups simply dispatching covert agents overseas at one extreme, and on the other to something like, I don't know, Libya bankrolling the IRA, which Gaddafi did after um, Britain provided basis for our bombing of Tripoli in 1986. Now, Gaddafi didn't know anything about the IRA, didn't much care, but he knew their adversary was Britain. He wanted to punish Britain. So just on the enemy of my enemy is my friend, he bankrolled them, but he didn't have any control over what they did. Um, so the, one could chart out the different relationships between terrorists uh, uh, and the governments that have, have sponsored them, but it, it is very rarely the clear action of a state. In the case of, of bin Laden and uh, Saddam Hussein, they actually hated one another. You know, the evidence on this was readily available in 2001. I mean, bin Laden had, had offered to launch the Mujahideen against Saddam Hussein after the invasion of Kuwait, had, had offered to the House of Saud to do so. Um, House of Saud turned him down and instead turned to us, which was part of what uh, uh, turned him so fully against both the, uh, the House of Saud and, and us. But. Um, so this evidence was clear that, that there wasn't this purported link uh, or the, the very idea that they were acting in cahoots was preposterous to anybody who looked at this. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were many people in the intelligence community in the State Department who knew this. But again, I think their views were just not making it up to the top. And, and in framing it this way, we lost the, the support of our allies. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, our allies were aware of the fact that this link was misplaced or was not there. The, the other arguments we used were weapons of mass destruction. Again, this was linked to the fear of terrorism because the notion was that Saddam might give these weapons of mass destruction to Osama bin Laden. Now, quite how somebody is notoriously paranoid at, at Gaddafi would do such a, a thing has made no sense, whatever. Um, and then, of course, as you say, we, 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 we had the entire international community mobilized behind us, uh, and we squandered that. Um, they instead, you know, what we could have done um, was instead, instead of casting this as a war on America, cast us as what it was, an attack on humanity. There were citizens of over 60 countries killed that mm -hmm. day. Uh, the governments of all those 60 countries and more were happy to rally behind us against the perpetrators of this atrocity. And instead, we, 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 the only grievances we cared about were our own. And we launched, we 
depicted this as, as uh, an attack on us. And, you know, we were cast into the role of Goliath against David, and that's not a comfortable role to be in. And, and finally, you, you point out uh, maybe the central problem long-term in a way is the failure to educate the American public about right. who the adversary was. Talk, talk a little about it, and then we'll move in to, to what the problem is. Well, I think there was a real opportunity here, again, to lead and to, to, use, to educate the American public, both about the implications of being a citizen of the most powerful country in the history of the planet. What happens, uh, you know, I think Americans believe or have an, a sense of our uh, role in the world, our positive role in the world, and, and they believe in our values and they assume that those values are self-evident. Well, I think our citizens need to understand that our virtue isn't self-evident when, you, uh, when you're on the receiving end of our policies, however well-meaning they are. And that was an opportunity to educate the American public about that. Also an, an opportunity to educate the public about terrorism. Um, yes, this was an extraordinary and unprecedented atrocity, but the likelihood that any one American would be killed by a terrorist is still less than being killed by a bee sting or a stroke of lightning. Um, we should have educated the American public about the deeply psychological nature of this, this weapon. Educate them about the realities of risk and what risk they were actually at. Mm -hmm. I mean, the truth is Americans the past few years have felt far more vulnerable than we did when there were tens of thousands of Soviet nuclear weapons mm -hmm. trained on our, uh, our cities. When I think, in fact, we were far more vulnerable then. Um, you know, Americans stopped flying. Uh, economists have, have calculated that you know, 1,200 additional people died on the roads because of the fact that people were, were driving more and flying less. Uh, we should have educated, this would have been a, such a, a powerful defense against terrorism. A, a, a resilient public is a real weapon in our arsenal. Instead, I think, Partly, maybe because they were fearful themselves, or maybe because they felt it would enhance their position. Instead of assuaging people's fears, I think uh, our government has uh, found those fears. Right, and, and as fear mongers, they really played in to the hands of, of the terrorists and, and their goals, as, Absolutely. You, as, you, as you just described them. Absolutely. So let's talk a little about who the terrorists are, not in the sense that it's, it's uh, Al-Qaeda, but in the sense of what are the common themes when when uh, looks at terrorists uh, uh, across the board that one finds? What are the var variables that account for the behavior? Well, this is a, a crucial and very difficult question. I mean, there is no profile, there is no individual profile of a terrorist. Psychologists who've interviewed terrorists and former terrorists and prison terrorists are unanimous on this point. One thing they have, I think, is a highly oversimplified view of the world. They tend to see the world in, in terms of good and evil, good mm. and bad, black and white. And secondly, they tend to see themselves as, as idealistic and altruistic, as sacrificing themselves for others. And I give many examples in the book of, of individuals, individuals who are helpful, other-directed, heroic in some ways, in many ways, and, and then join a terrorist movement, self-consciously sacrificing themselves for this community with which they identify. So far from meeting our notion of them as deranged psychopaths, many of them are you know, good parents, um, good teachers, young idealists, who are self-consciously sacrificing themselves for a cause in which they believe, and in the view that their sacrifice will advance this cause, which is beyond themselves. And they start as disaffected individuals. Right. I, I think that what you need for uh, to ha the causes, if you will, of terrorism are this lethal cocktail with three ingredients, a, a disaffected individual, a complicit or enabling community, and a legitimizing ideology. Now, we tend to think it has to be a religious ideology. It doesn't. Many other ideologies, be it nationalism or Marxist, Leninism or Maoism, have mm. sufficed. Certainly, if the religion, if the ideology is religious one, it, it's much easier to cast the conflict in cosmic terms. But it doesn't have to be religious. Um, and then the role of the community, I think, is absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. One of the things I, I worry about most is the, the role of the internet here in creating virtual communities of support. Because in the past, you really needed um, a surround, a complicit surround in order for, for terrorists to thrive and to evade the authorities. But increasingly, we're seeing evidence of you know, young men in Leeds or Glasgow 
who are communing not with people in their own communities, but rather through the internet with a virtual community of support based in Pakistan or Saudi Arabia or what have you. That, that I think, is quite a sinister development. And, and let's, let's explore this kind of play between nationalism, which sometimes motivates terrorists, and, and the, the, the effect of globalization, so that you get this weird uh, and new interplay uh, between signals and messages coming from abroad, just in, in terms of seeing pictures of events in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the Israel-Palestine conflict that, that become a mobilizing agent and that empower people to think about acting when they're, uh, they're in London and have been raised middle class, uh, although their uh, original ancestry was Pakistani, say. That's right. I mean, you look at somebody like Omar Sheikh, the man who's been convicted of the, the brutal murder of Daniel Pearl. I mean, he was radicalized while he was a student at the London School of Economics mm -hmm. in England, watching a movie on the treatment of Muslims in, in Kosovo. Um, so, again, you're absolutely right. It's through, uh, and we're increasingly seeing the young Algerians or, or Moroccans who are, uh, and indeed Saudis, who are going to Iraq to, to uh, for a chance to, to hit back at the American forces mm -hmm. because of the atrocities they're seeing on their TV that they see the Americans or they believe the Americans uh, are, are committing uh, and they want to strike back at that. So they're being mobilized, not by anything they've personally witnessed, but by um, what, what they're seeing, uh, the, what the, the sufferings of the people uh, with whom they identify. Again, you see this in the uh, video, the posthumous video issued by Sadiq Khan, who was the leader of the London bombers. I mean, he tried to justify this attack on, on the London underground in classic just war terms because of what he claimed to be the atrocities America and Britain were committing against uh, Muslims in Iraq. When, when you talk about your own uh, background and, and growing up Irish in in uh, this uh, culture in Ireland, which had this saw England as the uh, as the enemy, uh, you you sensitize us, and it's a sensitivity we need to the our, our failure to have a sense of the history of our adversary, the particular right. movement, and so mm -hmm. on. And so, one of the the striking things that emerged was the historical record behind uh, bin Laden's fanatical uh, ravings about the United States and so on. So, so there was a history there. For example, after the Iraq war, we positioned and kept garrison troops on the Holy Land in Saudi Arabia. So this, this really becomes a very important variable uh, that, that it strikes me that your background really sensitized you to. Well, I, th I think it's enormously important. Again, it's part of the education piece. I mean, if we, we looked at, you're absolutely right, this deployment of our troops was, was the cause in which bin Laden exploited this for, for years and used it as evidence of our perfidy and, and generated huge amounts of enmity against us. Now, we could, have, we could have placed those troops on an aircraft carrier and they would have protected our interests in precisely the same way. But we didn't because it was more convenient to us and less expensive to put them on the ground. We never bothered to listen to what bin Laden was saying. Now, you know, I think if you asked you know, 100 Americans at the time um, if we had troops in Saudi Arabia, you'd be lucky to find one who knew that we did. We just didn't much care. But if you question people in the region, people knew those troops were there and they found it offensive. And yet we didn't care that they were offended by that. And so had we removed them or not placed them at the time, had we listened to what people were saying, which was, was so self-evident at the time we should have been doing, um, we could have saved ourselves so much grief. So yes, I mean, I, I think perhaps it is my personal background that sensitizes me to this. I, I vividly remember watching scenes of Bloody Sunday. This was a civil rights march in which British paratroopers opened fire. I was, you know, 13 or something at the time. Um, and being just blinded with fury, uh, you know, would have, would have joined the IRA in a heartbeat if they'd let me. Uh, as I saw it, here were... Uh, British soldiers doing what the British had always done in Ireland, which is murdering unarmed Catholics. Um, 
you know, the, the, the rage and anger that I felt at that and the willingness to go try and write it was, was enormously powerful. Fortunately, I was too young, and by the time I, I uh, was a bit older, I had more sense, but I can understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and and in, in the case of uh, the, the fight that we have undertaken with uh, militant jihadists, there, there is a history of Western involvement in, in the region in modern times, the Lebanon War, uh, the, uh, then the intervention in Iran and then the rise of, of uh, Khomeini, then, then thirdly the Afghan War. And each was a kind of a stepping stone to building a, a sense of uh, the U.S. In, 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 in this current age that we're living in, on the one hand. But at the same time, there were individual radicals like q who were defining an ideology. What, what I'm trying to say is that events mm -hmm. and the words of some of their thinkers came together to define the kind of ideology that you say is critical for mobilizing terrorists. That's right. And it seems to me our policy should be geared towards you know, the potential recruits of these extremists. Mm -hmm. We can never persuade the particular extremists or the people willing to use violence against us, or most of them, that, that they're wrong. The goal, I think, should be for us to understand how moderate Muslims in the Middle East, for example, see our policies. And there is such an enormous gap between how they perceive us and how we perceive ourselves. And we should be focused on reducing that gap. And you take something like um, the, the sanctions on Iraq, um, prior to the war. Now, I think most Americans believe that this was uh, evidence of American restraint. We obviously had the power to use force against Iraq, but we didn't. We were restrained, and instead we imposed sanctions with the view of punishing the government, but not the Iraqi people. You know, the, the impact of those sanctions was devastating on the ground. Two UN, um, um, two people who worked for the UN for years uh, who oversaw the program resigned rather than preside over what they felt was a humanitarian catastrophe. Americans had no clue about this. Bin Laden claimed, and with some justice, uh, that you know, 500,000 uh, Iraqis died as a result of these, of these sanctions. And this just seemed to most Americans to be a preposterous charge. So I think it's incumbent upon us that we have uh, a much clearer notion of how our, our View, our actions are understood on the ground, and we need to be out making our case as to why we're acting, them, uh, acting as we are. There should not be this enormous gulf, or we can never hope to persuade the moderates in these communities to repudiate the extremists in their midst. You make a distinction between the goals of terrorists that are really long-term and the short-term. And let's talk about the long-term, because when, when, you, when you look at, in the comparative terms, on terrorists in history and in our own times, they basically don't have much of a program uh, that helps us understand what world they're going to bring into being. Yes, this to me is one of the most fascinating, actually one of the things that surprised me most when I started getting into this field trying to ascertain what precisely it is that the terrorists are, are trying to achieve. What would their new world look like? Um, and most terrorist leaders, almost without exception, are extraordinarily vague about this. They are so fixated on destroying the, the current world when they pay very little attention to, to what the new world will look like, other than very vague notions of perfection. Um, I was initially very, very surprised by this. So, if, if, you know, if you look back at the writings of somebody like Marx, you find that he too was so much more eloquent and detailed in uh, cataloging what was wrong with society than what his, his new world would look like. Um, so I think th that speaks to the kind of person who chooses to, to the, the kind of man of action, if you will, who chooses to become a terrorist. Uh, He's focused much more or mobilized by what's wrong rather than the positive things he's trying to create. And, and the, the exception, I guess, would be the ethno-nationalists, basically, who basically want a nation state, basically, in many cases, that narrow subgroup of the terrorists. Right, they do. It's clear what political structure they'd like. But even if you look at interviews, and I cite interviews with Pabarakan, for example, leader of one of the most successful ethno-nationalist groups, the Tamil Tigers, I mean, he, he's very vague. He says it'll be power for the people, mm. but he, he's not much more specific mm. than that. And in terms of the short-term goals, which, which really affects the, uh, the soldiers uh, in the terrorist movement, uh, you 
give us a, a definition, the three R's. What right. are the three R's? What are these short-term goals? Right. What I think are the, the immediate driving goals of all terrorists, whether they're ethno-nationalists or religious or social revolutionary or what have you, no matter where they are in the world, are, are what um, I call these three R's. Well, the first and by far the most important is revenge, the power for revenge. Um, any terrorist I've ever seen interviewed or interviewed or statements I've read um, are mobilized by the power of revenge, not necessarily against something they personally have suffered, but usually the community with which they identify. I think it's very difficult to overestimate its importance. The second is, is renown or glory. Um, terrorists have always sought publicity. Without it, they, they can't survive. Um, and this is why they try to carry out spectacular, so they get more publicity. But, but renown implies much more than this. Um, it's also a, a desire for glory to redress the humiliation they believe themselves to have suffered for, at our hands. And so for the, for the run-of-the-mill terrorist, if you will, uh, renown or glory within his own community is often enough, increased social status within his own community. But with the leadership, it's increasingly glory on a, a national and even international scale. I mean, I think we see this in the most recent Bin Laden videos. Um, you know, he's given up the Kalashnikov. He's no longer walking through the mountains. He's sitting behind a desk trying to present himself as a worthy interlocutor of global statesmen. Um, one of his statements that I found the most bizarre was um, he, went, he criticized American hypocrisy once for admitting Jerry Adams into the White House. I mean, his sense of peak was palpable. Here's this Irish terrorist admitted to the White House, and he, Bin Laden, is stuck in his cave in Wajiristan <laughs> or wherever he is. I mean, he clearly yeah. thinks he should be a, an interlocutor with President Bush. So this, this desire for renown or glory, I think, is powerful. And the third one is reaction. Uh, terrorists invariably are action-oriented individuals in this action-oriented in-group. It's, it's through action that they communicate with the world. So by our reacting to them, we demonstrate their importance. And the bigger our reaction, indeed our overreaction, feeds right into them. Because the more we react, the more powerful we demonstrate they are. So when we declare bin Laden to be public enemy number one of the most powerful country in the world, that's elevating his stature. Uh, so, so I believe that they are the, the immediate driving motives for terrorists, both individually and organizationally, are these, this desire for revenge, for, for, for renown, and uh, to provoke a reaction. You, you're suggesting, I think, uh, later in your book, when you look at uh, rules uh, that, that, we should, uh, that should guide our policy, that we start disadvantaged because democracies by their structure, the electoral cycle, uh, the, 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 the facility uh, for using military power in a superpower like the United States, that these work against the kind of uh, education uh, that is required and acting on that education, mm -hmm. namely, well, it's a very different phenomenon and so on. So, so talk a little about that because it seems like we're we're destined by the structures of our government to respond in a way that, that's not the most suitable. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, um, well, that's more pessimistic than I would choose <laughs> to be. I think with the right leaders, we could <laughs> but, respond more yeah. positively. But, but you're right. I, I, terrorists, yeah, again, they're quite subconscious about do this. They're quite uh, explicit that they try to use, you know, it's a kind of a jiu-jitsu approach of using our, our energy uh, uh, against us, exploiting our, our free press, exploiting our competitive political system uh, to their advantage. Um, they do this, they do this knowingly. I mean, the timing of bin Laden's videotapes, for example, the last one prior to the pres presidential election, so on, he's clearly trying to have an impact. And because, in particular, of the competitive media, and there is a real desire to, to fan fears, to make this, uh, you know, to spread the word for terrorists. But that doesn't mean it, it can't be done. And I think there are examples, it can't be done well, I should say. I think there are examples of governments uh, who have handled this differently and well. And here I would point to the British government um, in recent years. Um, I think you know, the question of Northern Ireland has had bipartisan support. I think the... Um, the recent peace agreement with the IRA has been an example of 
politicians putting political pro progress above partisan political advantage. When the IRA laid down their weapons, um, you didn't have uh, Tony Blair claiming victory. Uh, to have claimed victory would have made it much harder for the IRA to, to lay down their weapons as they did. He could have scored real political advantage from doing so, but he restrained from doing so. Similarly, just this summer, Gordon Brown, uh, in the same way, when the uh, Britain declared an end, or quietly declared an end to the, um, the British military campaign in Northern Ireland. Again, this was a real opportunity to claim political advantage. We have successfully solved this problem, as they have. Uh, but it, nobody did it. It was very quiet. Um, now, again, it, it's very hard in a competitive political system to expect our politicians to behave in this way. But I, I think we should hold our politicians to higher standards. And when it comes to national security, it shouldn't be a political football. And I think what we've done in this country is replicate what has happened in many other countries, where the opposition has been so worried about being labeled soft on terrorism that they've been very reluctant to articulate a coherent alternative. Uh, so we haven't really seen a coherent alternative because everybody's terrified of being labeled soft on terrorism. What, what are the most important guidelines that you think we should follow uh, if, if we're uh, when we elect a new administration who may be more attuned to uh, uh, maintaining the resiliency, as you mm -hmm. call it, of the public and mm -hmm. in, in ed educating about uh, the, the struggle? Well, the first step would be to articulate a, a coherent and achievable goal. We cannot win the war on terror. We cannot eliminate evil from the world. I think we can contain the threat from particular terrorist organizations. We should focus on that, and I think we could achieve that. Second principle that should guide us, I think, is uh, simply to, to live by our principles, um, uh, which I think we've manifestly failed to do over the past few years, uh, at a cost both in our moral authority and pragmatically in our ability to prevail. Um, the example I use in the book is the example of General Washington during the Revolutionary Wars, um, in which more Americans died and British prison ships then died on the field of battle. And General Washington wrote to General Howe complaining about this treatment and insisting on better treatment, and he never got a response. But when the American officers captured, I think it was 221 British uh, soldiers prisoner, Washington immediately sent word to those um, um, to his officers saying, you must not treat the British prisoners the way they treat our our prisoners. Instead, you must treat them the way we wish they were treated, because we're in a war in which we're claiming our rights as men, and therefore we must be willing to accord those rights to our adversary. It seems to me if that principle had prevailed in the past years, the world would never have seen the photographs of Abu Ghraib uh, or indeed Guantanamo that have done so much, I think, to undermine our authority, uh, our moral authority in the world. Next point would be to, um, to try to separate the, uh, in the, those willing to use violence from the broader communities in which they operate. So to mo mobilize moderate opinion on our side. And to do that, we need to engage in a much more aggressive, well-financed, systematic campaign of public diplomacy than we've engaged in. Now, I think even the best designed campaign, public diplomacy campaign, will fail if we have policies on the ground which are hugely unpopular. So. I think we are going to, I believe we will, uh, our stay in Iraq is short-lived. I think we're going to have to manage our exit from Iraq in such a way as to minimize the damage and then, and then aggressively pursue a campaign of public diplomacy. I think we need to also mobilize others, be willing to mobilize others, both the international community and moderates within uh, these countries um, to support us. Uh, I think we also have to have patience. We have to keep our perspective. Uh, bear in mind that the, uh, um, uh, you know, our country is not under siege, that this is, we are infinitely stronger than our adversaries and we should rely on our strengths against them rather than um, play into their hands by inflating their ability to harm us. If, if students uh, in our audience were to watch this program and they're interested in terrorism, they're, they're struck by you know, your, your intellectual journey, how would you advise them to prepare uh, for a future in national security studies in which terrorism and, it's st and the study of it is going to be an important uh, task? 
Well, the first thing I think I would try to do is, is learn uh, languages of the region, understand, study the cultures of the region, so that again we can understand how our policies appear on the ground. So I would certainly recommend to students that they, they um, learn other languages, that they study these cultures as far as possible, that they travel to this part of, uh, to, or to different parts of the world, again, to gain an appreciation of how America is seen from the outside, not just from, from the inside. Um, again, understanding our government and understanding the principles on which it was founded and, and not, um, and I would also recommend them to study other instances in which uh, societies have been under threat and to see uh, which societies have done well, uh, have handled these threats well. But the single most important thing it would seem to me is to travel to the regions, uh, to speak, uh, to learn other languages and study other cultures. Louisa, on that note, I want to thank you very much uh, for joining us today. I want to show your book again, uh, What Terrorists Want. I suggest our audience go out and buy it and then send a copy to their congressman, maybe, <laughs> if we're going to uh, do this education seriously. Uh, thank you very much for My being pleasure, on Harry. our program. Thank and, you for having me. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. Um, but then when I came to the States, uh, I felt and started looking at the literature on, uh, on Ireland. I, I didn't work on Ireland for years. I, I never trusted my objectivity. I stayed very involved, but um, not academically. I simply, but I did read all the literature and I found that some, uh, it, this depiction of, of terrorists as one-dimensional bad guys uh, and psychopaths was was quite wrong, um, quite oversimplified, and certainly inconsistent with the many people I knew who had decided to join the IRA, for example. Um, so initially, my prism, obviously, was, was that uh, of the IRA and, and the Republican movement. But uh, it, it, I broadened out then to start studying other terrorist groups, and again, felt that the, the depiction of them in the literature was really uh, misplaced. As a, as a student of international relations first, and I, I believe your first book was on When Allies Differ, Anglo-American Relations in the Suez and Falkland Crisis. I'm, I'm curious as what you see as the, the skill set that is required to do international relations well. Well, um, as I said, my undergraduate degree was in history, so I, I come very much from the historical approach to, to international relations. And looking, that, that first book was actually looking at how allies manage uh, crises in which their interests diverge. So what I think I brought to that was a very historical approach, which is to go back to look at the documents of the period. I looked at the Suez Crisis and uh, under the 30-year rule in Britain, the archives were just opened when I was doing my research. I also looked at the Vulcans Crisis and for that I, I interviewed all the members of Mrs. Thatcher's War Cabinet and many of the members of the Reagan, senior members of the Reagan administration. So the skills I brought to bear was the historian's uh, respect mm. for primary sources uh, and going back to the individuals and the original documents, which is... To that. Well, 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 tell us about your feelings, your thought processes, how you related to your family mm. as, as you, you saw these different perspectives. Well, I grew up, as I say, I, I would con have considered myself passionately Republican. I spoke the Irish language at, at one stage in preference to speaking English. I, I went to school for a time in an area in which Irish was the medium of instruction, and certainly there was a very powerful Republican, as in the Irish rather than American sense, ethos there. So then going to uh, Trinity, being very self-conscious, one of only three Catholics in my class, um, I started to study history with, uh, with uh, professors I very much respected. So my, initially I thought, my gut reaction was, of course, this is all nonsense. But once one got into it, once one started reading the documents, I was completely persuaded by their version. So I would go home 
and challenge many of what were the absolutely mm -hmm. accepted truths. And I remember my mother at one time uh, just dismissing this as Trinity talk. Um, mm -hmm. This is nonsense. Um, so it was fascinating, and I became fascinated by how two sets of people, well-meaning people, I have enormous respect and affection, both for my family background and then for my college professors, and realized you know, these two sets of people utterly believed completely different versions of the very same event that happened in this tiny country. So I became very interested by how two sets of good, if you will, people can yet interpret the same events so differently. And, and did you pursue graduate studies as a result of, of this set of experiences, or, or, or was actually, it unrelated? Actually, no. I, I decided I wanted to study uh, international relations largely as uh, an effort to escape the power of Irish nationalism or the smallness of Irish nationalism. So I decided to, to come to America to study international relations as a way of, of breaking out of that. Welcome to a conversation with history. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Dr. Louise Richardson, who is the executive dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. She is the author most recently of What Terrorists Want, Understanding the Enemy, Containing the Threat. Louise, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Where were you born and raised? Um, I was born in uh, the southeast coast of Ireland, in County Waterford, uh, which is a small seaside town. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Um, not self-consciously at all, actually. My parents were very apolitical, uh, but growing up in rural Ireland at a time where the past was always very much present, um, we grew up, I grew up in the same house. My mother had grown up and my grandmother had grown up and we were, I think, the fourth generation in this house. So we were deeply rooted in this community. So almost by osmosis, I picked up more from the community than my parents per se, their, their view on the world or their view on, in particular, on, on Irish history. Mm -hmm. And uh, how, how were you affected by uh, events, uh, being Irish in Ireland, growing up and, and so forth? I was very, very keenly affected by events. Well, we grew up in a world where, where Britain was the enemy. I learned history at school at, you know, at the age of nine, was writing anti-English poems, diatribes against England, because we thought, or we knew that they were responsible for everything that had ever gone, on, gone wrong in Ireland. Um, and then, of course, seeing Northern Ireland explode in the late 1960s, early 1970s. This we saw as just a continuation of the age-old British oppression uh, of Ireland. We just took this very much for granted. Um, in school, every morning, we, I went to the local convent and we, um, we said our prayers together behind a, uh, underneath a statue of the crucifix and a photograph of the seven men who were executed for their role in the 1916 Rising. So religion and politics were intertwined. Um, actually, the lesson of the crucified Christ and these executed leaders mm -hmm. tended to be one and the same, which is that you know, the fact that you're vilified in your own day or that the authorities punish you doesn't necessarily mean that you're bad or wrong. And mm -hmm. I, I've been very struck by that's very different. Even though this was all unstated, it's very different from the way my children grew up in this country and their sense of progress and if people are punished by the state, one tends to assume that they've done something bad. Mm -hmm. did, did you decide at an early age that, that you wanted to study this history or, or what in fact did you do your undergraduate work on? Well, my undergraduate work was on history and political science um, and I studied in Trinity College Dublin, which was an entirely different uh, world and the world in which I grew up. Trinity historically was where uh, the Protestant aristocracy were educated. So mm -hmm. many of the faculty were, were English. It was a very much a, a British institution. Uh, Trinity actually accepted Catholics in the late 18th century, but the Catholic Church 
didn't uh, permit Catholics to attend Trinity till till about 1970 or the 1960s, certainly. So it was a very different world. So I studied Irish history, but got an utterly different perspective mm -hmm. than the one I'd grown up with. And how did you adjust? Again, what I tried to do in, in looking at terrorism. Mm -hmm. now, now, let's talk a little about the, the study of, of terrorism, because in, in your book, uh, uh, and I think rightfully so, you express disappointment uh, at uh, the way terrorism was being approached in the, uh, uh, the studies uh, uh, that you discovered or, or knew about and so on. Uh, how do you account for that intellectual failure? Well, I actually think it was partly because terrorism was, didn't belong in any one discipline. There isn't a, a coherent theoretical basis in the study of terrorism. Instead, you had psychologists look at terrorism, anthropologists, some political scientists, some historians. And so terrorism was never at the cutting edge in any discipline. It never addressed, uh, could have, but didn't address any of the central theoretical debates in any discipline. So it tended to be marginalized in each of these disciplines. So, um, individuals, so there was this small cohort of what were known as the terrorism studies community, but we're talking about a, a couple of dozen people. Um, and they, I think, did have uh, quite a sophisticated and in-depth understanding of the particular groups that they looked at. But very few people were interested in looking at terrorism qua terrorism, so terrorism across cultures or across time. They tended to focus on the one particular terrorist group. Uh, and even today, we still don't have a, a discipline uh, of terrorism, per se. Was this also true, by the way, in, in, in the British academic circles, or did they do a better job of it because of the experience uh, with empire and, and understanding cultures? Um, actually, I think there it was mainly left to the military schools who studied counterinsurgency uh, rather than uh, terrorism, per se. So, I, no, I don't think it was essentially different. Now, uh, all of this, of course, has changed now, not in the sense that the quality is 